Welcome to part two of dipstick float valves for watering plants. We previously discussed a dipstick float valve where the body consisted of a three quarter inch pipe with an end cap. This was followed by a discussion of a seven inch open pipe design and a 15 inch open pipe design. All three models used centrifuge tubes as the buoyant force to stop the water flow. Let's now explore the possibility of utilizing extruded polystyrene instead of centrifuge tubes to provide the buoyant force. In a previous yogurt container float valve designed to water trees, the purple extruded polystyrene blocks on the left provided the buoyant force to press the sponge neoprene against the nozzle which then stopped the water flow. Extruded polystyrene easily floats on the water and most of its volume rests above the water. This block of extruded polystyrene becomes a float boat which provides a means to move this tomato almost effortlessly through the water. Extruded polystyrene has a uniform closed cell structure and is preferred as a float material over expanded polystyrene which has many cracks and crevices and can become somewhat waterlogged and this reduces the buoyant force. Let's try to make a float block for a dipstick float valve. A hacksaw blade may be used to cut about a one inch square of the material. The top of the centrifuge tube is a convenient template to make the correct size. This method of cutting isn't too precise, but it's good enough. See, the block fits in the PVC pipe and can freely move. The sticky side of the sponge neoprene attaches tightly to the block. The sponge neoprene was then cut with a scissors to conform to the block. Here's how the float valve will work. The rising water level will cause the block to exert force against the sponge neoprene, which presses against the nozzle of the button dripper and stops the water flow. Let's check out the buoyancy of extruded polystyrene. Here is a graduate cylinder containing 90 milliliters of water. The block of extruded polystyrene just floats on the water. It's almost like it doesn't have any weight. See, even two blocks have no weight. Well, actually, extruded polystyrene has a density of 0.03 grams per cc. So if these two blocks have a volume of 16 cc's, that still only weighs 0.48 grams which does not register on this scale which has a sensitivity of one gram. The block displaces about eight milliliters of water when it is immersed. Two blocks were placed in this seven inch length of open pipe float valve, which is connected to a water supply bottle with about 20 inches of head pressure. Oh wow, it's holding about a two inch level of water in the container. Let's analyze what's happening here. The wire stop for the button dripper is placed about three inches from the bottom of the float valve. The bottom block and maybe three quarters of the upper block were immersed in water. If each block has a volume of eight cc's, there would be about a 13 or 14 gram force generated by a rising water level, which would stop the water flow and thus maintain the water level. So now if my lettuce is running out of nutrient solution, I can just place a dipstick float valve in the tank and maintain a two inch solution level. That's pretty exciting to me. How much do you think the materials to build a float valve like this would cost? Let's offer a dollar and see what happens. Well, you'd get a float valve and a nickel and change. How is that for a deal? Here's the breakdown of the material cost. Of course, you have to buy a whole bunch of everything to get these prices and your prices may be different than mine. My next project was a 15 inch long open pipe design dipstick float valve with two extruded polystyrene blocks. This float valve is holding about a four and a half inch water level. The wire stop for the button dripper was placed six inches from the bottom of the float valve. At a four and a half inch water level, the bottom block and about a half of the top block were immersed in the water. That amount of displacement should provide about 11 grams of force against the button dripper to stop the water flow. Now we're going to get really extravagant and place three float blocks in this float valve. It looks like this float valve is holding a water level of about four and an eighth inches. At a four and one eighth inch water depth, the bottom block 
and a little more than three quarters of the middle block were immersed in water. This would generate about 14 grams of force against the button dripper to stop the water flow. In another trial, three different float blocks were used and the water level was about four and five eighths inches. In this case, both of the bottom blocks and part of the upper block were immersed in water. So why is this float valve not performing as efficiently as the previous float valve? At least part of the answer to this question is that the float blocks were crafted by hand and have different sizes and shapes. The next float valve on our agenda is a real corker. That's because corks will be used as the float blocks. Corks, which are about three quarters inch in diameter, fit nicely into the float valve body. Let's check out the buoyancy characteristics of these corks. They will be placed in a graduate cylinder with 80 milliliters of water. When two corks were totally immersed, the water level rose about 14 milliliters. That means each cork has a displacement of about 7 cc's. When the corks are allowed to float, the water level rises about 3 to 4 milliliters. That's about right considering that the density of corks is about 0.235 grams per cc, which means that 14 cc's of cork should displace about 3.3 grams or 3.3 milliliters of water. An advantage of corks is that they have a nice uniform tapered shape. And a disadvantage is that the sponge neoprene doesn't stick very well to the cork. Two corks were placed in an open pipe float valve and the water supply tank had about 20 inches of head pressure. This float valve maintained a water level of just a little over 2 inches. That's pretty good. The wire stop for the button dripper was located about 3 inches from the bottom of the pipe. It looks like the lower cork and about 3 quarters of the upper cork were immersed in water. That corresponds to about 12 cc's of displacement or about 12 grams of force. Let's move on now to a hybrid model which will employ a centrifuge tube plus an extruded polystyrene plug to generate the force needed to stop the water flow. Here is an example of a hybrid dipstick float valve model. In this design, the extruded polystyrene plug is placed at the bottom of the pipe. The twist tie wire easily prevents it from falling out of the pipe. This model was tested in a tank growing zinnias. At transplanting time, this tank was filled with nutrient solution. As the plants grew and these beautiful flowers emerged, the nutrient solution level dropped to about 6 inches. Then the dipstick float valve was installed to automatically water the plants. A 1 gallon plastic bottle was supported by an adjacent ladder and served as the tank for this float valve. This partially emptied bottle indicates that the float valve had released some water until it reached a certain level and then the water release stopped. Yes, this float valve is working. By the way, this bottle only contains water because nutrient solution would cause the development of algae which might plug the button dripper. Nutrient solution was added separately to the growing tank. There is a 6 inch mark on the wooden dowel. This indicates that the dipstick float valve is maintaining about a 5 and 3 quarter inch solution level in the tank. The wire stop for the button dripper was placed about 9 and a half inches from the bottom of the float valve. My toothbrush handle points out that a 5 and 3 quarter inch water level indicates that the float block and about 4 and a half cc's of the centrifuge tube were immersed in the nutrient solution. As time proceeded, there were occasions where the solution level dropped by about an inch. It seems that the float valve had become stuck and was no longer delivering water. So I removed the float valve and started shaking it around until it started dripping again. Now all is good again. Now I would like to make a few comments about dipstick float valves. The upward force of the centrifuge tube against the nozzle causes an indentation of the sponge neoprene. If the float valve is moved, the centrifuge tube might shift and cause a new indentation of the sponge neoprene. This might reduce the ability of the float valve to stop the flow of water from the button dripper. A tea bag might make a good filter to prevent the plugging of the button dripper. The inlet water tube could be placed in the tea bag and tied with a string. And there you have a cheap and easy filter. The pressure from water at two feet of height 
is about 60 grams per square centimeter. The button dripper nozzle diameter was 0.18 centimeter. The nozzle area was about 0.0254 square centimeters. So the force needed to stop the static pressure was about one and a half grams. If my calculations are wrong, please make a comment. Since it usually takes 10 to 15 grams of force to stop the water flow, I would like to briefly mention some inefficiencies in the system. The angle and the shape of the nozzle, the angle of force, friction on the sidewall, and efficiency of the sponge neoprene. A well-engineered commercial model could greatly reduce these inefficiencies. Individual dipstick float valves would be a good way to water containers on steps. And most folks have sloping or uneven terrain, so dipstick float valves might be an answer for you. Let's talk a little bit about material safety. Polyethylene tubing, of course, is made from polyethylene. And the centrifuge tubes and the button drippers are made from polypropylene. Polyethylene and polypropylene are considered to be safe plastics. There are sponge neoprene materials that are rated as food safe, but I could not find a rating on the material that was used in these tests. Corks have been used for wine bottles for many years. Now, there have been reports that some of the folks who drank the contents of these bottles have become disoriented, but I'm pretty sure that this ill effect is not from the corks. Styrene, which is the main component in extruded polystyrene, has known health consequences. High temperatures and the presence of fat promote the migration of styrene into food. Therefore, I am not comfortable with placing hot food in polystyrene containers. However, several studies could not detect styrene migration at the lower temperatures which you might find in nutrient solution. And styrene has a very low solubility in water, so that is very encouraging. Nevertheless, if extruded polystyrene float blocks are going to be employed in these float valves, it would be prudent to coat them with a safer material. PVC pipes are used in many watering systems, but there are lingering questions about its food safety. So it would be prudent to try to replace them with either polyethylene or polypropylene pipes. Suppose you are growing this nice crop of eggplants and you haven't added any nutrient solution yet since planting. And you find out that the nutrient solution level has dropped by more than half. You're going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to start adding nutrient solution quite often. Wouldn't it be great if you could just place a dipstick float valve in the tank and a constant solution level would be maintained for the rest of the crop? Now it is time to stand back and enjoy the lovely zinnia flowers and await the sounds of beautiful music. Music 